This is Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. It's powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. To get an extended 30-day trial, visit shopify.com slash masters. Hey, entrepreneurs, my name is Felix, and I'm the host of the Shopify Masters podcast. Each week, we put out podcast interviews with successful e-commerce entrepreneurs or experts to give you inspiration, motivation, and actionable tips to increase your traffic and sales so your store can generate the sales you need to live the life you want. In the last episode, Cindy Chan from animal-jewelry.com explains how she learns how to speak the same language as her customers to increase her sales. On today's episode, you'll learn from two entrepreneurs that stopped focusing on driving more traffic and instead focused on smaller but more qualified traffic. In this episode, you'll learn how to approach people in person to survey them, how to figure out your branding and messaging on your own, and how to begin to focus more on qualified traffic. Today, I'm joined by John and Rana Lustian from edible.com. That's E-D-O-U-G-H-B-L-E.com. I love that name. Super clever. Uh, edible is not your cookie cutter cookie dough. I'm sorry. <laughs> edible is not your cookie cutter cookie dough company. They sell the best edible cookie dough you'll ever taste. And was started in 2009 based off Los Angeles, California. Welcome, guys. Hi. Thanks for having us. Yeah, excited to have you guys on. So tell us a bit more about your store and the this uh, cookie dough that you sell. Yeah, so we uh, we came up with the idea in 2009 after a big food brand recalled 3.6 million tubes of cookie dough because people ended up in the hospital after eating the cookie dough that is meant to be baked, uh, eating it raw. Because who doesn't like to eat raw cookie dough? Um And I have been a pastry chef since about 2003 was my first kitchen job at Spago in Beverly Hills working with Wolfgang Puck, uh, an amazing opportunity. And then I went off to culinary school, Le Cordon Bleu, and um, ultimately this recall really inspired me and it made me think, why is there no edible cookie dough? Why? I just want to eat cookie dough out of the tub. And that's kind of how we got started. So we wrote a business plan. We won the competition. Um, after grad school, we realized we needed money to start a business. So we had to get real jobs. Um, and then finally did a soft launch, uh, with an e-com business, uh, starting with, uh, Shopify in 2013. And then 2014, I quit my job to really focus on the business full time. Very cool. So you had this, uh, notion that, or not notion, but you felt like, why isn't there edible cookie dough, like you said? So how did you guys begin this process of creating a product that was going to be able to be sold? Like, What what, what was the very first step that you had to take once you knew, recognized that there was a potential need in, in this market? We, we, did some, we did some recipe testing first and foremost, because for me, that was a low hanging fruit. Anytime I got to make dessert in the kitchen, I was happy. So we started with uh, recipe testing and tasting people in school, professors and peers. Um, and then we, we did surveys. I would stand outside Whole Foods markets and, and, you know, with my clipboard and my surveys and asking people to answer a series of questions about dessert consumption and cookie dough consumption. Um, and we kind of took some feedback and, and grew from there. And this surveying that you did in person, I like it because like you were getting out there, you're talking directly to people. But a lot of times, uh, entrepreneurs, e-commerce entrepreneurs, they we we always have a tendency to do things online, right? Let's run a survey, let's send it out online, let's find people online to to ask these questions to. Why did you feel it was important to go stand outside of Whole Foods and ask these questions? I think for us, we we saw the product specifically at a natural uh, grocery chain. So we, we wanted to kind of see, first of all, what who was shopping at these stores um, outside of just our own experience. You know, when, when we do our own grocery shopping, you're not, really, um, you're not really looking at who else is doing shopping there at the same time. So for me, it was just to get also face-to-face contact with a consumer. Um, oftentimes when we send online surveys, sure, you're, you might be, um, to, you know, setting your demographics of who you want to take your survey. But it's nice to have that face-to-face contact with people who, uh, you know, will or will not buy your products. 
Mm-hmm. And how many how many questions were you asking though? You're stopping these people when they're on their they're doing their shopping. You know, maybe people are on the way home from work and stopping by the grocery store. A lot of times, then we we feel like, well, we don't want to inconvenience people. We don't want to intrude on their lives. Uh, but of course, there's very valuable research for you guys to to get, especially this early on in your business. How did you approach them? Like, what kind of questions did you feel like you need to get answered? Well, we had we had a series. I think it was about twenty questions. Um, you know, we asked people for about two minutes of their time. We it'd be a fun survey. It's about dessert. Um, and I remember I, I felt it was very awkward. Um, it's, it's hard to, I, I mean, I'm always the person that says, no, I don't want to take surveys outside of the mm-hmm. grocery store. I'm busy. I just came to do my shopping and I have 20 minutes and I got to go. Um, so, you know, I hate when, when the people are like, do you want to save children's lives? And you're like, no, I don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> and for us, it was more like, you know, do you like dessert? Can you take a two minute survey about your, you know, about dessert consumption? Um, I didn't, and it's also, you don't want to buy, have any bias or put any ideas into their head. So you don't want to say anything like, you know, you know that eating cookie dough could kill you. So do you want to take this survey about a, an edible cookie dough that's safe to eat raw? Um, you know, so we wanted to make it very unbiased. Uh, just about in general dessert consumption, like, and then towards the end, it, we would sneak in little questions about, do you eat raw cookie dough? Why do you? Why don't you? That kind of a thing to just also understand people's feelings about the dessert and when they would or wouldn't eat it. Yeah, and I think also just you know we we're in business school, so we were doing everything you know by by the textbook, you know, and doing all the research and pulling you know great data and numbers and things. Um, that said, these were the trends. This is what people care about. It's a health conscious consumer. You know, they don't want all these preservatives. They want gluten free. They want you know, vegan. They they want all these things. Um, and so, one, we wanted to see, okay, is this does this really apply to the specific category that we're talking about, um, or just just how generalizable are these things when we when we're able to sort of actually talk to real people or are they just kind of like checking boxes like, yeah, that would be nice. And I think what we found out is that, that people love cookie dough. It just like sort of lights people up. Um, and if there was a, a better tasting safe to eat option that they love it and it didn't have to be void of all the great taste. It didn't have to be gluten-free and vegan and sugar-free and everything else. It just had to taste great and be healthy. And I think, um, you know, that helped, really kind of direct us to this place that was like, okay, let's not talk to this super niche audience. Um, you know, if we can just nail a great product that is safe to eat and a ton of fun, um, there'll be some serious appeal. And when you say that you didn't want to focus on a super niche audience, you're talking about people that were already previous, uh, cookie dough eaters. Like what was the niche audience that you, you had an idea of focusing on at first and then expanded from? No, I, th- I, th- I think everything that we were reading at the time was saying these are the trends in the grocery space and the consumer packaged goods space, right? Like gluten free is a big trend. You know, I, I think it was a little bit after like the South Beach diet. You know, a few years after that, it was all about cutting back on gluten's and cutting mm-hmm. back sugar and all these things. Um, and so we did a ton of recipe testing around that. It just ended up not tasting very good and, and being very granular. And we said, why create something that we don't think tastes that great, but it might be talking to, you know, only 5% of the sort of total market universe when um, we could create something that was just a fantastic tasting product and the other 95, you know, would be in love with it. Maybe, maybe those, that 5% we wouldn't get. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, people eat, the people who get it, got in trouble for eating raw cookie dough, they were eating big food brand cookie dough that they found at their local, you know, mass supermarket, not their, you know, they're not looking for diet food. They're not looking for vegan or gluten free. They just want a yummy dessert. Mm. And so that's kind of, you know, we realize like we, those are the people we need to target because that's, that's where the market is. Right. So this is a great insight because you could have not done this and then gone down that route of what you found in the, the textbooks, academic approach of finding out that gluten was popular. So maybe you've just gone with a gluten-free cookie dough and just gone down that route. 
but from serving potential consumers, potential customers, you're able to understand that there's a totally different market, totally different angle that you could approach with your business. Now, was this all discovered through just like one, one, I guess, uh, session of survey taking? Like how long, did, how much research, how much in market, like out on the field research with these surveys were you guys doing before you came up with this, this insight on this particular angle that you wanted to take with your business? I mean, to be honest, I think it's still something that mm. we talk about t- till today. You know, at, mm. at some point, it's like what paralysis by analysis. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to get a hundred different opinions from a hundred different people, and different people have their own taste preferences. And at the end of the day, you can't please everyone, um, and you just need to figure out where the market lies. Um, and it's something that we're still figuring out because if it's not the product formulation, it's the price or the packaging or the size or the placement or the the store that it's in. Like maybe, you know, Whole Foods is a one great, you know, uh, avenue where people would look for a product like this. But um, let's say another specialty store like Gelson's in the Los Angeles area has an older demographic who doesn't necessarily seek out cookie dough because everybody's in their, you know, 50s and 60s. So it really just depends on really getting to know your market. And I think that's where we have a really strong advantage because our online, you know, our e-com business is so strong. A lot of brands that are only in stores, they don't know necessarily who's buying their product. Whereas we have a very clear idea of who's buying our product because of our e-com business. Mm, makes sense. And so like you're saying, this this uh, understanding of the market, understanding of how to present your product to the market is ever evolving. You're always learning about different ways to uh, different channels go down, different ways to to uh, from, to message your, your brand. Uh, how, but at the very beginning, how did you know that it, what you had was enough to move forward? Because a lot of times that you know, we spend, entrepreneurs will spend a lot of time doing this research, but then they get stuck in this analysis by paralysis stage that you're talking about, that maybe their business could be successful, but they never get off the ground because there's too many uh, doubts along the way that they've uncovered. What made you guys uh, know for sure to move forward? So I think five years is what made us know we had to move forward. Because <laughs> we started it in 2009 in terms of the idea, and then finally, In 2013, that's when we kind of just looked at each other and we were like, we've got to get something out there because you can go through a hundred iterations of your logo and, you know, a hundred ways, different packaging sources to figure out who's going to supply your packaging and should you do paper and should you do plastic and should you do foil? And I mean, it's like never ending the decisions that, that get to be made when you start a business. So ultimately we found, um, you know, a, a website, a deal website that had a big email list. And they wanted to kind of send out their, you know, the launch of our product on our website. And, you know, from that, that's kind of what got us started. We just thought, let's put up a website. Let's just pick a packaging. We can always change it. Let's pick a logo. We can always change it. And we we were like, let's just see if this is even a thing. Like, if we get this company to launch us, you know, give us some PR and nobody orders it. Uh, then we'll know we've got to make changes. And then maybe, you know, maybe all those people who got that first email blast can give us some feedback and and let us know why they didn't order it. Uh, And I just went from there. Yeah, so th- this five years that, that elapsed, like you're talking about, so sometimes enough to get people to realize, wait a second, I've wasted all this time. I could have gotten started way earlier. Um, so on that first, uh, okay, was, let's start with this. How did you get in touch with this? This uh, Is it like a daily deal website? What was this website that gave you your initial PR? Yeah, they, so they are no longer in business, but they were called Daily Candy. And we, they had a national daily candy website and then um, they had local ones. And so we were launched just locally with dailycandylosangeles.com, I think it was, or dailycandy.com slash Los Angeles, whatever it, it used to be. But the, the site is no longer in business, unfortunately. Daily Candy was, is a, was a daily, they either had a deal or they just gave you some mm-hmm. cool information or about a business or a venue um, in your area. So it'd be like a cool new apparel brand, or um, you know, you could you could subscribe to either your city or the national website or any city basically. They had like, you know, 10 cities and they would give that same information, you know, the best local ice cream spot or the best, you know, the cool new apparel brand or any kind of new and this is like pre not necessarily pre-Amazon, but it was like before you really did much online shopping. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and it, it was cool because it always had direct links to the site or it gave you the address in your city of where to go or who to call. And so it was great. It was for, great for PR. Mm, so this uh, deal website that reached out to you, did you already have some kind of business at the time? How did they know? How, do you guys, how did you guys connect with this uh, deal website? No, so, so we were in business school at the time and, um, and the USC network is pretty strong here in L.A., um, and our class was pretty small too, so everyone knew each other and, and we're great friends and all like, so we're very um, sort of willing to, to help sort of extend network and contacts and a buddy of ours uh, knew someone that worked there and said, hey, you got to connect. This seems sort of so perfect in their sort of demographic fit. Um, so that, that was the introduction. It was just um, sort of uh, having our pitch down, making sure the people around us sort of um, were a part of the process and knew what we were doing and felt like, you know, they were helping sort of build this alongside. And then they were, you know, that much more sort of inclined, I think, to think about how they could look at their network and um, extend that to us mm -hmm. to support. Mm, for sure. Yeah. Then I think networking is, of course, uh, a huge asset that you need to you tap into. And when you first approach this uh, daily, this deal site, what what do they want? What do they want to return? Was it some kind of uh, percentage of the sales? How did how was it arranged? No, so just just to clarify, it's, it it wasn't a, a daily deal site. It was it's more like um a, a, like the skin or like pure wow or one of these more lifestyle okay. sort of content blogs or newsletter businesses. Um, so it, it was more just about uh, at a national level, you know, what's happening in sort of the fashion lifestyle space. And to Rana's point, locally, you know, is there a cool new thing? retailer that opened up is there a cool new restaurant i think um if you know anything about dry bar which is a huge sort of uh you know nine figure business now uh they credit sort of the early marketing launch with a daily candy sort of feature so um so yeah it's, it's more in that realm but there were there was no rev share or anything it was just hey we love it we think um our view or our readers will be really interested in it we think it's a great fit so mm -hmm. uh, right up so we sent them samples and and had a chat with them, and um, that won them over. Okay, that makes sense. Now, so it was they were basically looking for content, looking for cool things to promote to their their audience, and you guys were a good fit for it. Do you remember the the results from from this um, this? I guess was it just one email blast? Like how much did they they promote your your business? It was one email blast. I don't remember how large their list was, but. Um, but we had about 200 orders from that blast. So that's kind of how we, how we launched. And did you have 200 uh, products and in inventory to ship out? Or how did you prepare for this kind of uh, big PR push? No, we just, we made everything fresh to order. And, and we still do. I mean, so that, I mean, that's something that I think we, uh, you know, certainly as we scale bigger and bigger and get into become a national brand in, in grocery stores everywhere, you know, we certainly have to, um, carry inventory, but um, really a lot of our sort of manufacturing process hasn't changed much since those early days where, you know, we're, you're, you Felix are ordering today um, and we will make your order, you know, today or tomorrow and, and have it out um, in a shipment to you that day. So, um, so certainly our like production resources were strained, you know, over the next couple days. Um, but, uh, whether it was that daily candy sort of email blast and fulfilling all those orders or a little bit later when we were featured on Reddit and had, you know, almost 2000 orders in 48 hours, uh, come in, you know, I, I don't think anyone ever felt like we were behind on, on delivery, uh, even though we were making it fresh sort of as the orders came in. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So this, uh, business plan competition that you guys won, was this prior to, or, or after the, that, that, uh, that initial email blast? Oh, that was like five years prior. Oh, five years prior. Okay. So what was the, what was the results of, like, what, why'd you enter this business plan competition and what did you guys get out of uh, going through a process like that? Yes, yeah, so we entered it through school. So it was through the grad school at USC. Um, we, we just submitted our plan and then we got to pitch to a panel of uh, experts. So we had like the CEO of Bristol Farms on the panel, which was like meeting a celebrity, you know, to like the food business. It's like to meet the CEO of a grocery store chain. Um, and he actually loved our product and said that he alone, he and his six kids alone would keep us in business just <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. Cookie dough. I think people liked having a tangible product. It wasn't just some big idea. It was like we brought in samples of cookie dough, little plastic souffle cups, and we like printed out a logo that we had designed on 99 Designs. Um, it's funny. We have the logo, the old logo we have on our website, actually. Yeah, on our I website. saw it. We, want, yeah, we were very inspired by Ben and Jerry's and that kind of cartoon-like feel and very just serendipitous and whimsical and fun, um, cartoon-like. So we we basically, yeah, so we, we pitched the idea and it seemed very, it was like a no-brainer, you know? And I still, even now, when I do demos at grocery stores, people are like, this is genius. Either why didn't I think of this? Or I'll have people in their 50s that are like, I had this idea when I was in college. Like my girlfriend and I sat around eating cookie dough and we thought, why isn't this a thing? And they're like, now it's a thing. That's awesome. So did you use any parts of that uh, business plan five years later after you you started putting it into action? Yeah, it just keeps, it kept us focused. Um, you know, because like I said, that 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 analysis can continue to work its way into everything that you do. And it let us focus on, you know, what were our high level, um, what was, you know, what was the strategic direction? You know, were we going to go specialty or were we going to try to make this more mass? Um, and, and, and it helped us with just the industry knowledge as well. Mm. So if you were to go back and start from the beginning and you would still go through this business plan process, it sounds like. So for someone out there that is maybe thinking about getting started for the first time or they have started but don't have that much focus and wants to go back and have a solid business plan. What are some things that are important to think about or to include in a business plan? I think the biggest thing is is your industry research to understand like who are your competitors and what makes you different. Um, You know, how are they underserving the market and how is your product uh, or service going to serve the market better and also having a really clear understanding of your customers and talking to as many customers as possible to get their feedback, whether it be about shopping habits, packaging, the product, their, their purchasing behavior, um, just really having a great idea and a, just having a very sh- solid comfort level with who your customers are going to be. And, and also maybe even a plan of how you're going to grow your customers and like a a strategy there with some budgets. Mm. And was all of this, like you're saying, it gave you a focus, but was it all accurate when you look back on it? How accurate was it? Like what you guys projected, what you guys wanted to do? Like how much did you follow that five years later? No, I think we, uh, there's a lot of knowledge I wish I had back then. And it's just knowledge that you kind of get after you learn the hard way or not necessarily the hard way, but the slow way. Um, of actually getting your product out there and then figure trying to figure out like why is it selling better here than there or like it sells a lot better at this price point when it's on sale than it does at this price point or why does it sell for you know one price online and and a lower price in store and understanding like the difference in consumers um, at the different outlets that you'll sell your product like in the online market is a lot different from the wholesale market um, so just kind of all of those things combined and also just really learning, like to us learning how to get more consumers. I'm still like, how do we get more people on our, to sign up for our email list? How do we get more people to learn about our product without having a massive advertising budget or really any advertising budget? Yeah. Look, I would say, you know, um, you don't have to sort of, um, go apply to business school and, take out a lot of student loans and spend a couple of years of your life sort of going through academia and, and sitting in these classes and crafting these big extensive feasibility analyses and um, business plans that you like um, sort of tweak over a course of a semester. I mean, we had the luxury of doing that. Um, and so it, it was a great way to sort of get a lot more out of our, our MBA. Um, and I will say, you know, of the, very extensive sort of business plan that we put together, the main things that still apply and that I think we can draw out and say, like, you know, we really identified that there was a problem. We did enough research to say, you know, this is a big enough 
category for us to go after. Um, we did a lot of sort of in field research, you know, that we talked about earlier. Uh, and then we created a product that, that was really worthy of the business opportunity. It wasn't just saying this is a great opportunity. So it's a shoe in, you know, we could have all those things line up, but the product itself, uh, doesn't deliver, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, how great or how feasible something is if the product isn't great. So, um, you know, the core takeaways from all those classes was just, is it a big enough problem that there's an opportunity, you know, and do you have the solution to fill that? And then, you know, what we've learned so much in, in sort of actually launching has been the real education. You know, you're, you're learning every day how to manage, you know, customers' expectations and how to tweak your product and your brand and um, how to talk to, sort of buyers and diversify your business model and all these things that, you know, we never sort of laid out when we were sitting in you know, the USC library doing sort of research on Mintel or all these obscure sort of, you know, research databases. Yeah, I agree that you don't really get to learn until you are in the game itself and actually playing the game because like you're saying, all of these situations that you were put into after launching the business, it's really hard to to learn all that stuff by reading the textbooks and kind of being behind the book, behind the screen. Uh, so this success that you were able to get early on, once you were able to launch uh, with the, the email blast, um, you, you mentioned before that a lot of people come up to you and say things like, you know, I had this idea, why didn't I think of this? Did you start getting competition very quickly once you started getting this publicity? Like were people, were copycats moving into your space? Yeah. I mean, I, so I, I think that came a little bit later. Um, you know, when, once once Rana quit her, her other, so she at the time was consulting for restaurants um, and we decided to sort of go all in and she quit. Um, a couple days in, she talked to someone that was sort of a power user on Reddit. And I feel like while Daily Candy was the great little sort of beta test, you know, um, marketing blast that that put us on the radar, maybe locally to some select group of foodies, you know, this this Reddit sort of attention really put us on the map nationally in a big way. Uh, and so I think, you know, about a year later, we saw um, some people start to pop up and, um, and say, wow, look at what these guys have been able to build. And they're clearly tapping into something, um, and, and saw what we were able to create, you know, online and, and platforms like Shopify make it uh, easy to sort of turn a, turn a shop on pretty quickly. Um, so we've definitely seen, seen people pop up since, um, for sure. Mm-hmm. So I actually want to talk about this this Reddit experience that you had. So uh, you guys knew some kind of, uh, I guess, power user, someone that was popular on Reddit. How did you uh, connect with them? Was it somebody that you knew personally? No, we, we didn't seek anyone out. I mean, Rana can talk to it because it was um, she just sort of randomly was put in touch with the CMO of some sort of candy store chain, right? And- yeah, I was, um, I was setting up a meeting. This was my first week full-time for Edible, and I... I found a candy store in Glendale and the CMO was visiting from San Francisco. So we had set this meeting date um, and turns out he's a, an influencer on Reddit. Um, so I had no idea, but he liked the product. It turned out it wasn't a, wasn't a good fit for the candy store. But that night, all of a sudden, we were getting all these orders. And so when we went to check traffic on Shopify, we saw they were being referred uh, from Reddit. And I didn't even know what Reddit was. Um, and we saw that he posted, basically he posted, my friend started an edible cookie dough company and it's incredible. And then he posted again and said, oh, I should probably tell you the name of it. It's edible.com. And then we had like 2,000 orders in 48 hours. It was crazy. Wow. So you guys are able to fulfill all 2,000 orders just from from, from you two? No. <laughs> it was no. We had to hire, that's when we, I like posted on Craigslist. We had to find a new kitchen space. I mean, we, we ended up getting all the orders out in, I think it was like six days. Well, yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was me coming home from my day job at like, you know, seven or eight and then working till like two, three at night. And we were tapping, we were, you know, buying all of our friends dinner and they were, they were loving it too. They were chipping in and, and amazed by what was happening with this little thing that we 
So it just started on paper and then just blew up overnight. So we had friends and family and everyone chipping in and, and we were, we were really excited to get everyone's product out on time. Mm. It, what's, what's involved regulation wise when you're creating a, a food product, especially if you are just starting out, it seems like there could be a lot of, is there a lot of overhead in, in, in renting kitchen space? Like, do you have to go through all of that early on? Uh, in the beginning, there's really not much regulation. Um, there's definitely like, so in California, or maybe it's specific to Los Angeles even, but there's something called the Cottage Food Act, where you can make products at home. But really, the only time that's regulated is if you're going to go into like a farmer's market. If you're selling online, there really aren't regulations. Like there's no health department visiting mm-hmm. your facility. Um, so it's nice if you have if you have plans to grow, um, it's nice to have, uh, to operate under somebody else's wholesale permit or, or seller, uh, or health permit, like in, like we rented space from a catering kitchen. Um, but there's also places where you can rent kitchens, wholesale or kitchens by the hour. Um, so we, you know, it, it just took some research and finding something that's not too far from us. Um, so the commute wouldn't be too bad. And, and we were able to get kitchen space like one day a week. But that week where we had the, all these orders, we were able to um, basically work around the caterer schedule. So we we were able to get into the kitchen every day, but at random times. So, you know, then it becomes a challenge to find staff that can work at those random times, you know, every day that you need them. Um, and then making sure that the product quality is still great because for, for example, like I may, I had to make the product. I wouldn't let anybody else make the product. So I was hiring people to scoop and package and, um, and even shipping. I didn't want anyone else to do the shipping. I wanted to make sure that I, I could manage and, and, you know, make sure that the, the customers were getting what they ordered. Mm, so this uh, this influx of orders that you received, this two thousand orders in forty eight hours, um, I'm assuming that there was still going to be some, uh, you know, big boost in in the daily orders that you were getting. But there, it probably subsided a bit, right? There was kind of this big influx, and then I'm sure it died down a bit after the Reddit post that went away a bit. Now, how do you hire in a, in a situation like this? Because you're posting on Craigslist, you're asking for people for help because you obviously need to fulfill all these two thousand orders. But the job isn't like it's a full-time job yet, right? Because you don't need someone, maybe you don't need someone full-time yet once this big influx dies down. Did you have to, I guess, how did you manage that? No, it really was like, I mean, we, we had a couple of people, I guess, you know, that we paid, but it was heavy on family and friends. I mean, mm. we were, you should, I mean, there were just stacks of empty shipping boxes that we'd create, you know, by the hundreds that were just filling up inside her parents' house. So, uh, you know, that that we would all do together, stick sticker stickering lids um you know all these things were happening with her mom her dad my friends you know whoever was around that we could talk into <laughs> yeah us out. order dinner for yeah. <laughs> like yeah. can you over for three hours tonight and sticker lids yeah so we definitely um it was a friends and family sort of yeah i can imagine that because it'd probably be really hard to try to hire for for hire for a job like this because you have to train them you have to get them up up on speed and then all of a sudden you know you might not need them as much anymore it's a big investment for you and of course anyone else that wants to 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 be a part of it uh you know friends and family they'll they'll love you and support you no matter what so that that makes a lot of sense so after this big boost uh you know the the 200 orders uh, that you received from the email blast the 2000 orders that you received from reddit what was next like what was the traffic plan moving forward i'm sure you, you weren't just sitting there and and hoping and praying that you would continue to get more kind of spontaneous boost of traffic. Did you have, um, I guess, what was the plan to, to drive traffic from there on? Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we knew that um, our marketing plan couldn't be, you know, be featured on Reddit by someone that is going to have their post seen by, mm-hmm. you know, thousands of people. That's, um, and so, you know, I'd love to say that, you know, because we went to business school, because I had a background in marketing that we had this brilliant, you know, outline sort of marketing plan. And I, I think we, we rode the wave of Reddit and were able to get a lot of sort of follow-up um, sort of press interest and, and media coverage, you know, from like Us Weekly and Glamour and, and a bunch of different um, publications and websites. Um, so that, that really sort of like, you know, subsisted us um, for a number of months after and, and, and even, I would say, 
through a year after, just because, you know, somebody heard about us from somebody that saw us, you know, on Reddit a long time ago. And so they were, they were, they were approaching you then they, you weren't, you weren't approaching them. These, uh, yeah, I mean, we were, look, I, I mean, we were, um, I, I was still working my day job and I still do have a day job. Um, and Rana was sort of furiously sort of fulfilling orders and, and recipe testing and perfecting that, you know, our marketing plan was essentially, um, let's, let's ride all the incredible sort of wave of earned media from Reddit, um, and all the sort of follow-up media that we received. Um, let's acquire and, and turn sort of this interest from people visiting our site and placing orders into uh, sort of a database. Let's continue to remarket to that database because they're, they're interested. There's some of the sort of early adopters, you know, everyone that, that came to us, I think um, they're really excited to not just stumble upon us and try us, but they're really excited to tell their friends that we um, exist because we were this new novel thing that they felt like they've always been waiting for. So, you know, I, I feel like our brand played really well into sort of like a word of mouth social media brand. And we heavily leaned into Facebook and Instagram, uh, Pinterest and Twitter a little bit later, but you know, it, we're not selling widgets, right? We're selling like this really fun product that like everyone has the same sort of, you know, excited, uh, sort of whimsical like reaction to eating cookie dough and all these memories. So, you know, what we had to do is just continue to be in front of them and put, you know, some really great content in front of them. Um, and, you know, they were sharing it. And, and so it was more just about continuing to touch them to launch new products. You know, that was always sort of our biggest marketing plan is just to create great content around our product, which, you know, is pretty photogenic to begin with, you know, we're not like selling widgets. Um, and then to create sort of newness and to create a reason for people to come back to our site through uh, fun, new sort of product flavors. Mm, gotcha. So the, the initial boost of PR led to more PR and then all those customers are coming and buying. You are then remarketing to them through their email and presenting new, new products to them through that way too. I think one of the, one of the uh, uh, interesting things that I want to learn more about from you guys is that because the PR came on so quickly and such a big blast and all these new customers are coming, did you guys already have your brand and your messaging nailed down at that point and you were ready to, not spit it out, but you were ready to, to let it, uh, I guess, spread everywhere that you could? Or were you guys still trying to figure out what was the company, what was the brand, how we want to message it? Yeah, I'd say the things that we had sort of in a pretty good place, sort of in our back pocket at launch was we felt amazing about the product that we created. And the, the cookie dough just is like one of the best things you've ever tasted. It's, um, uh, everyone always says, oh, it tastes like cookie dough like the best cookie dough I've ever tasted. I was like, well, it is cookie dough, mm -hmm. so, so it just should taste like. I think they're so used to sort of some different sort of refined process version of it. Um, uh, and so we, we had a great product, and, and, and then we sort of had a couple people that I used to work with in my previous life um, sit down with us and, and work on sort of basic logo, basic packaging, sort of a positioning statement, um, some basic assets that we thought sort of spoke to our brand. And so we had those things pretty firmly nailed down. And, you know, just as like, you know, one of the, the key things, I think themes that keeps being brought up is, um, you know, the importance of getting, getting it out there and iterating. And, and while we sort of love our brand and it's, um, and, you know, we love the, the path that it's taken and the way that it's matured. I, I think we're, we're excited about sort of where it's going and we've learned so much from the, uh, the customer that, you know, we're, we're continuing to evolve a little bit more and really say, celebrate sort of the fun of cookie dough and, and maybe not be so serious, but yeah, so we had our, we had our branding down um, to, to a pretty good place and we had our product down. So, um, you know, once all that, once all that interest came in and the orders came in and, you know, people calling us and asking about, you know, you know, what the Genesis is, what we stand for, you know, those, those talking points were pretty firmly nailed down. That's cool. So when you worked with, um, this uh, friend of yours to, to figure out the positioning, figure out the branding, uh, how involved was it? Like, how do you even, if someone 
doesn't have somebody they can rely on, doesn't know who to hire for something like that. Uh, any any tips on how they can go through this process themselves to, to nail down their messaging and nail down their positioning? The best thing that you can do, I think, is 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 just get out there, walk through shopping aisles, um, you know, do the competitive research to understand who's out there, how they're talking to the customer. I mean, like, there's there's no sort of easy easy way to do it. Um, you know, everything that we've already talked about. You know, we were doing a lot of online surveying um, and online research, but getting out and talking to people and seeing the things that they had in their shopping carts, you know, all that stuff helped us sort of say, you know, who this consumer is, what they want, what other things are they buying, what's the competitive set, what are we going to do that's different um, and fresh, um, and and what's going to stand out, and so um, so it's just about. I, don't know, I mean, it's sort of like there's there's some basic templates that we always look at, which are just kind of like a SWOT a SWOT analysis, right? Like, what are the strengths of what we're creating? What are what are the weaknesses? What what are the opportunities and threats? And and how those things help um, sort of continue to define what makes us unique. You know, we're always looking at uh, the competitive landscape and our consumer because those things are both evolving so quickly all the time. Mm. So once you do have this figured out, what were you were you sending these kind of messages to your your email list, like these past customers of yours? Uh, how, what were you what were you emailing them? Uh, I mean, the majority of our emails, um, you know, because we we try not to be sort of overly promotional, and I think that's that's we didn't want to be seen as sort of a um, sort of a discounting brand, and somehow sometimes you can really feel that pressure. Um, you know, to kind of break through an email box because people do get so many sort of spammy emails. Everything's 20, 50, 80% off flash sale by now. Um, you know, we, we still, you know, we will run promotions, but we still feel like our product is so unique and, and, and really stands out and can stand on its own. Um, so oftentimes we were, sort of, you know, celebrating a new flavor and, and showing a great image of what that flavor looks like and um, talking about, you know, we put together a little flavor story about, you know, why we created it or sort of some romance copy about, mm. you know, all the ingredients um, uh, and, and, and sort of how delicious they are when all mixed together. Um, so it was, it was just kind of playing up like the, the taste appeal um, continuing to show like our customers that we are someone who continues to sort of um, explore, you know, new flavors and new combinations and new things. And if you thought that you visited our site once and that was it, you know, you're, you're going to, be, you're wrong, right? Like there's a lot of reasons to continue to come visit us and to gift us to your friends. Cause um, we always have some new flavors. So it's more like a flavor driven thing. We certainly have, uh, you know, uh, sort of editorial calendar around all the key gifting holidays, like like Valentine's and obviously Christmas and those sorts of things. Um, so we just kind of like continue to try to stay top of mind with our new flavors, you know, especially promoting those things around special sort of gifting times of year. And sometimes all we have to do is sort of just write about some sort of fun holiday, like National Cookie Dough Day or something like that, and we'll we will do a little sort of promotion for, to celebrate, you know, little holidays and things like that. But, um, yeah. And so you, you, you find a, a reason other than to promote the product to email your list. So whether it be to tell the story behind the process of creating it, the reason why you created it, or talk about or create content that, that, uh, that your audience or your customers uh, may be interested in, but does not necessarily have to be directly related to your product those are ways that you've been able to create content and emails that are useful for your, for your customers. I'm, I'm assuming that also helps increase open rates because people know that it's not just some, you know, buy this now email. Um, so one, one thing you mentioned to me about your conversion rate, this is off air. I believe it was in the pre-interview questions. One thing you mentioned was that 
Uh, and a way to improve your conversion rate for you guys was to move away from casting your net too wide on your marketing efforts and really being efficient in your targeting of highly qualified traffic. Can you say more about this? Like, what were you guys doing before, and what did you move towards to to increase this, uh, the, the increase your focus on highly qualified traffic? Yeah. So I, you know, we have we try to check every major box in in our marketing right for an online business and. And one of those is certainly um, a light sort of ad spend on, on banners and other things. Uh, and so it, it just had us looking at, uh, I think, our KPIs a little bit differently, where, where we were driving a ton of visitors and, um, and we felt really good about having all that traffic continually um, you know, hitting our site. And our conversion rate was good. And we were like, oh, um, you know, that, that's still above industry averages. Um, and, you know, a, a healthy portion of our traffic is coming from mobile, which normally has much lower conversion. So, you know, adjusted, you, it, we felt really good about the conversion. But we said, you know, we, we weren't happy with um, sort of the spend relative to the amount of people that were sort of getting through the flow and adding things to their cart um, and checking out, we just, you know, we weren't happy with it. We, we had some weird anomalies on, on different countries that were seeing, um, some of our ads and, and we certainly never, uh, you know, we don't ship internationally. So any of those things, we wanted to make sure that we were sort of trimming those things out of our buy, uh, as we thought they were supposed to be in the first place. And so, you know, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we're not, we're not sort of, because we're doing so many things, we can't sort of physically place all these buys directly. And so we're having to rely on, um, you know, freelancers to help us or, or small little agencies. And so I think we just took a weekend to really stop and, and look at what, where the traffic was coming from, um, what sources were working, what, what weren't. And so we, we just sort of started to trim the fat and look at, you know, uh, sort of all the a, a, a B testing that we were doing and the different sort of demographic testing that we were doing. And we said, I mean, quite simply, I mean, it's not like rocket science. We said, okay, these four things are really sort of over-delivering and over-indexing relative to the other ones. So let's double down on that. Let's trim everything else. And while our sort of top of funnel um, sort of quantity of traffic has 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 not been as big, uh, the conversion is 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 much stronger, and that's just because we're getting more qualified people, and we're we're serving up ads, you know, that are, are relevant. What kind of uh, tools or um, or uh, reports or analytics do you use to determine all of this? Like, what were you looking at to determine that this particular channel, this particular type of ad, uh, was uh, not, or I guess, under indexing for the type of customers that you they're actually, or a type of visitors that would actually convert? Yeah, I mean, we we use AdWords um, and and Google Analytics. Uh, we we run some really small, occasional like spot budgets on on Facebook, which has a, a good analysis tool. And then we work with a retargeting company called Adroll um, that that helps sort of, you know, once you leave our site, it's always crazy to run a, uh, you know, I've been, um, you know, in, in and around e-commerce for a long time. And so, you know, I'm very comfortable when we, you know, can hit a 3% conversion or a 5% conversion or a 7% conversion, you know, for a day or a week or month at a time. Um, and she's always like, I can't believe that more than 90% of the people that visit our site and learn that there's this cookie dough product don't buy it. Like she's just... And it's one of the great things about her. She's like, it's just so absurd to me that 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 ninety out of a hundred people, you know, don't buy something. She's like, I would buy it in a heartbeat. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so yeah. So we use we use Adroll to to go after those people again that that do leave those the ninety percent of people plus uh, that that Rana thinks is crazy. Uh, we we go follow them around the internet, and and that ROI is pretty pretty good. They just need to sort of be exposed to, to our message and our product a couple more times, and then they realize that they made a mistake. <laughs> right. So when you look at the, I think this is an important point because a lot of times uh, we, there's so much conversation, especially when a store, a store, a business starting out, is how can we just get more people to come to us? Say, how can we get more people to look at our products? Um, but a lot of times you're driving traffic that is not going to end up converting. You're spending a lot of money on people that are not going to buy your product anyway. And I really want to nail down like how you.
you can, if someone out there wants to sit down and look at their marketing channels the way that you guys are able to do it, how can they, how can they do this? If they're going to, let's say, uh, Facebook or Google Analytics, what should they be looking for? Or how can they set up their analytics in a way that allows them to uh, notice these, uh, I guess, not unworthy visitors, but visitors that are not going to give you a return? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, if you have a Facebook page, then you have some demographics about who your audience is. If you have a database of emails, you know, use MailChimp or something, you know, you have demographic, you know, and, and geographic information. Um, you can do all kinds of things, right? You can, you can export your database of email contacts and create lookalike audiences in, in Facebook, for example, right? So Facebook will say, okay, based on those thousand or 10,000 or hundred thousand email addresses that you uploaded, um, we can kind of put together a rough demographic of who your target is. Um, so th- there's all kinds of ways that you can, um, sort of refine that approach. Um, you know, but you can't get to like the optimal endpoint right away, right? You don't just leapfrog to like, here's the four things that work best. Like you really, you did have to start, you do have to start by saying, by making some very sort of calculated guesses in some cases, but it's some data, it's some like some sort of gut, right? And you put it out there and then you're going to be able to refine and tweak and, and, and that's an iterative process. But, mm-hmm. um, but you do have to just start it, right? So take, take the demographic information that you can glean from who's sort of most engaged on your posts, who responds on Facebook, on Instagram, and all these things. Pull data from your website, from Google Analytics, from your email addresses, and you'll be able to sort of compile, or, or to, to Rana's point, right, get out and talk to people. Um, you'll be able to compile sort of, here's roughly who my demographic is. It's 18 to 35 females in, you know, major metropolitan cities that, you know, also sort of watch The Bachelor or whatever, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point that, that you can't expect to get these three, four, five percent conversion rates right off the bat. These are things that, you know, take many years, like, like, like your example, which is uh, uh, you guys have had success and it's still these, like, 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 you're, like Rana is saying, these uh, unbelievable uh, conversion rates, right? Because you have to, it's an iterative approach. You have to constantly work on improving it. And I think if you come into expecting to get crazy conversion rates, uh, you're definitely setting yourself up for, for failure and disappointment. So you have to spend that money, like you're saying, early on and, and guess, have educated guess at the demographic you want to target. But then once you actually start getting customers, once you start getting people interacting with you and interacting with your brand, don't I guess don't spend so much time guessing, but use the data that you that you do have. Use the data that you have from the customers, from your database of people that are bought from you in the past. Build these lookalike audiences on Facebook, or at least just look into who they are, so that you can become even more educated when you uh, decide to run more campaigns. So, and all these tools make it so easy. I mean, they they really you know they're just getting better and better. And so you you look at the money you spend relative to to what it costs to acquire that customer. Um, and, and they should be able to break that out for you by ad or, you know, by sort of platform spend. Um, and so that's one of the things I I consistently look at. I always look at how many people are visiting my site and how much money did I make that day? And that's, that's kind of a, a good health check for me. If, you know, are we making a dollar a visitor? Are we making $5 a visitor? Are we making, you know, a cent a visitor? Uh, to me, that helps me sort of. Um, constantly, okay, we're we're on a good track this week or this month or today, mm-hmm. uh, or something crazy happened and 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 some media uh, talked about us and it's the perfect audience. You know, when the skim talked about us, uh, I don't know that we've had a more perfect sort of demographic alignment um, on a media platform, sort of talking about us, uh, and and that just shot through the roof that day, but. Mm, awesome. So other than the tools you already mentioned, like you mentioned ad role for retargeting, Google Analytics, or what other um, tools or apps or services do you rely on to run the business? Uh, we have a few other things that, you know, uh, we're always sort of testing. You know, we, um, we like Shopify for that. Um, you know, there's just so many different apps and, and we kind of are constantly evaluating and testing things. We have, you know, we use um, a, a loyalty app that rewards people, sort of a rewards app that rewards people for sort of sharing um, information. And if they're, 
if their friends make a purchase, they get, you know, uh, sort of a coupon to, to spend themselves. This is your referral candy that I see referral on the site? Candy. Yeah, we have sort of a, an exit pop-up um, app that we use just, you know, if, if someone, God forbid, you know, exits their shopping cart, um, you know, perhaps we'll, we'll offer them up a 10% um, discount if they sort of give us their email and, and complete the transaction. Um, so uh, there's different tools that we use um, to sort of help optimize and, and learn what's working. We're, we don't always sort of keep the apps, um, but, but we certainly test a, a, a big number of them. Gotcha. So what do you guys want to focus on in this year? And in, in 2017, where do you guys want to focus your attention on for the business? Yeah, so, so e-commerce has is, is always been sort of the backbone of our, our company. Um, and we're continuing to sort of, I think, super serve that audience with uh, just an incredible range of, of flavors and some, some fun new things that we have launching in 2017. Um, so we'll, that'll always be a, a core focus for us. But we're also, you know, for, for those people that have been begging for us to come to stores you know, and they want to run out or, or have, you know, some app go pick us up from their local grocery store right away. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're there, you know, so we ultimately want to be sort of wherever people want us to be. So if, if that's a, a local grocery store near you, that's where we want to be. So um, we're definitely focusing on grocery stores. Um, uh, we've, we've, we've been doing that here locally in the, the greater Los Angeles area. Um, with a ton of success. And so we're looking to expand that success and uh, hopefully be on a, a grocery aisle near you soon. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time. So edible.com again is the website, E-D-O-U-G-H-B-L-E.com. Anyone else you recommend our listeners go and check out? No, I mean, you know, everyone loves our Instagram handle uh, page. So that's just at edible. Um, check us out. Um, we'd love to connect with you on social as well. Awesome. Thank you so much again. Thanks, Felix. Here's a sneak peek of what's in store for the next Shopify Masters episode. If you're trying to go deep in your audience, um, then it, you don't want to have too much random stuff on there. You want to just focus on your target market. You think, what's your ideal target customer and what do they want to see on your website? Put that on there. Thanks for listening to Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. To start your store today, visit shopify.com slash masters to claim your extended 30-day free trial.